بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله We had yesterday the pleasure to listen to your talk about Muslim women and men and now we have some uh, questions about the interesting things you told us sure. So the first question is about um, the concept of conspiracy of silence. So it's an interesting term you used. And it's about the, sto it's about the fact that the stories about Muslim women are not told often or even aren't told at all. So why is this and what can we do about it? It's interesting uh, to me. I, I, um, uh, I think it's very clear that in, in many places and and it, it's improving now I think we've started to the la the last number of years started to raise this issue more mm -hmm. clearly but um, and bring it to people's attention but it, it really began for me um, once I had uh, studied for a number of years Islamic history and the history of Islamic traditions in depth And being able to read original sources, especially the tabaqat and the raja mm -hmm. literature, and other literature that that described the actual lives of Muslims in different periods and times, and I kept being struck by these amazing women. Mm -hmm. I would keep coming uh, upon these women's names, and at, when I became a Muslim, I just, you know, I, I was told what Islam was like, and I was told things like women don't have a place in public life. There's a the private life, and you know all of these all of these explanations, and also by many um, uh, feminists and others who criticized Islam for never giving women a place, mm -hmm. saying that you know when Islam rose, that women were uh, confined to the home, mm -hmm. to confined to the haram. Um, And most Muslims were saying, well, yeah, that's where they should be. <laughs> and it's a good thing. So rationalizing this. But then these original texts were telling me a completely different story. Mm. Completely different story. And I would find women's names in the um, chain of transmission of texts, of fiqh texts, of hadith texts. Then I would look them up. I would look at these uh, tabaqat and rajal books and find the women. So the question that, I, I, uh, that came to my mind is, what well, I mean, Why are why have they disappeared? Mm -hmm. Why are the women kept in the closet? Mm -hmm. Why are they, you know, what's happened? And even it's quite interesting because uh, what what I saw was that there were many modern editions or publications of traditional texts, mm -hmm. but they weren't faithful. They weren't um, uh, scholarly publications. Mm -hmm. And a scholarly mm -hmm. publication, you you work very hard to make sure that. You, um, when you make a modern edition, you have it as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. You accurately re reproduce the original text. What I found in the modern publications uh, put out by, by many contemporary religious publishing houses is that they actually removed a lot of the material. Mm -hmm. So they would say that this, uh, this book is, you know, this is the, um, uh, Ibn Qayyim's... Um, Kitab al mm -hmm. or uh, some book, uh, Imam al Ghazali's Ahi mm -hmm. al Din, or some other book. Um, but actually, what had happened is that the publishers had removed a lot of the material. And sometimes they'd removed a lot of the material that uh, was about women. Mm -hmm. And um, that clearly is an ideological mm -hmm. move. That is a deliberate move. Um, based on a view that uh, women should have a certain place in society. So this is one of the reasons. The other reason is something else, and it's, um, it's that we, as human beings, very naturally are attracted to people who are like us. Mm -hmm. We, in a crowd of people, you know, if you don't know anyone, who are you going to go to to talk? Someone who you feel comfortable with. Why? Because they somehow they seem like you. This is a very natural human um, reaction. And I think what had happened is that uh, for a number of reasons, political, historical reasons, the people who were producing Islamic literature in the modern period, primarily men, 
And it was just a question of them resonating with these stories. Resonating, for example, with the stories of the, of the male Sahaba primarily. Mm -hmm. And so you would find books, modern publications, uh, stories of the Sahaba, for example. Mm -hmm. They might have, and I don't want to give the name of any particular book, uh, but you, you could look at, if you look 20 years ago at the major publications, they might have one or two of the Umm al-Hatim Mu'minin, for example, mm -hmm. or Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her. Mm -hmm. But then the other 30 entries were all male Sahaba. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, was this deliberate because they were hiding women? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think they just read the stories of the men and they resonated. Mm -hmm. So when they selected mm -hmm. them, they, they put them in. Mm -hmm. Now, because more women, more Muslim women are involved in scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, I think for us, it's not that we're deliberately looking for women either, or we have an agenda of putting women forward, but we read a story of a Muslim woman and there's a certain resonance, a recognition in, mm -hmm. in her. Um, and so we also want to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is part of, the, uh, part of the solution is, of course, that we need both men and women and men and women of different ethnic groups, different mm -hmm. cultural groups, different racial groups who are involved in scholarship and leadership so that we all bring our interests and perspectives and the stories that resonate with us into contemporary literature and teaching. Mm -hmm. So I have a related question to this uh, first one. Um, so because you talked yesterday about the post-colonial Islam and you said that we are living in this era um, and that this post-colonial Islam is shaping our idea of Islam and especially um, of women and manhood. So uh, can you explain it? And is this also a reason for um, something like conspiracy of silence? So many, um, many generations of Muslims now have been uh, born into the post-colonial period. I mean, colonialism, European colonialism of the Muslim world started in the, as early as the 16th, 17th century in some areas. Um, that has, uh, it changed Muslim societies and the many generations who were born after uh, began to um, naturally experienced Muslim life um, and knowing that this was the Muslim life of their, you know, their, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, they started to think of that as traditional Islam, that this is Islamic tradition, because not only was I raised this way, but my parents were raised this way, my grandparents were raised this way. Not fully understanding that the way they were practicing Islam had been completely changed by the colonial encounter. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly important when it has Uh, when we look at the situation of women in Muslim societies, because there's an awful lot of evidence. There's a great deal of evidence um, about the removal of women from public life, specifically by colonialism. Um, some of the, uh, if you look at a um, wonderful book by Professor Wa'al Halaq, who's a professor of Islamic law now at Columbia University in New York, He has a, a, a very thick textbook on Sharia and the history of Sharia. Um, he gathers a lot of sources there to show, for example, that in the pre-colonial period, uh, women tended to be uh, up to 50%, around half of the individuals who both established the Al-Qaf, the religious endowments, as well as overseeing them. Mm -hmm. The oversight of a religious foundation or a charitable foundation is a, is a public role. Yes. It is a role of public authority. You know, we have, if you look at a lot of modern Islamic literature, the, the dichotomy that is established is that the public, uh, public functions are for men and private functions are for women. Mm -hmm. that, that reflects a, a European Protestant bourgeois 19th century division of society. It does not reflect what Muslim societies looked like for a thousand years in the mm -hmm. classical period. 
In the classical period, there was not that kind of division between public and, and private in that same way. Mm -hmm. the, the strength of Muslim society was on this broad diversity, decentralized approach to religious life, education, charitable giving. Um, the government played a minimal um, protective role, ensuring the security of society, the security of the borders, um, ensuring the rule of law. But uh, religious life, activity, functions, education, education was not top-down, education was diverse and pluralistic precisely because it was based on these independent, free, um, charitable endowments. Mm -hmm that women were very deeply involved in establishing, overseeing, um, and, and setting the terms of what were priorities. Uh, most modern Muslims don't know that mm -hmm. unless they have now studied this recent mm -hmm. scholarship. And so this is why we need to understand how deeply colonialism affected the very structure of society. When the colonialists came in and they destroyed these alqaf, or they took them over, mm -hmm. um, where were these women to go? And also, anytime there's war and occupation, it becomes, and society becomes very unstable and dangerous, uh, it's natural that people withdraw uh, their public activities, especially women. Mm -hmm. um, so they begin to withdraw at their public activities and try to stay in a zone of more security. So it is true that during periods of, of colonialism, uh, military unrest, occupation, you'll find far less women in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. But that's not because that's Islamic, that's mm -hmm. the right way, that's the role of women in Islam. That's because normal society is under occupation and disruption. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to reclaim our heritage and understand how deeply not only individuals but our societies have been traumatized, mm -hmm. how normal relationships between men and women were traumatized and, and devastated by this uh, colonial period. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I want to, um, to ask another question about a term you used. It was the Sunnah of the Quran. Mm -hmm. You talked about the uh, responsiveness of the Quran to women's concerns as a kind of sunnah of the Quran. Could you give an example and what was the impact on gender relations at the time of the Sahabas? Could you explain it a little bit? This is um, a, a view that I've developed based on um, uh, the recognition that the Quran um, can be understood in many different ways in terms of what the Qur'an is saying to mm -hmm. us and meaning. So we know that, that when we study the Qur'an, we can study it linguistically, we can study historical context, um, we can study the, the, the rulings. There are also, um, it's very fruitful to study themes of the Qur'an, mm -hmm. themes of justice, themes of um, care for the poor, themes of uh, the relationship of, of, of course, Allah and humanity, um, themes of collective responsibility, a as well as individual accountability to Allah. These are all major themes of the Qur'an. We also know that part of, of the meaning of the Qur'an is the very sound of it. Mm -hmm. the, the recitation of the Qur'an, the, the way the Qur'an, the Qur'anic language the words, the, the um, uh, structure of it, the, the fact that the Qur'an isn't just a, a document written in straight prose, but has all of these aspects of, of um, rhyme and rhythm and um, things that make it beautiful. The beauty is a message of the Qur'an that we should be beautiful in our religion. We should be beautiful in our religious speech. Uh, we should use that, so that's a message. But the responsiveness of the Qur'an, this is, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, it is this concept of the sunnah of the Qur'an that I've developed based on this, which is that we know that when we talk about something general like the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, we could say the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad was kindness, generosity, right, attentiveness to people, and we could support that with individual hadith. 
there's there is uh, of course the the expression the Sunnah of Allah mm -hmm. with humanity. What is the Sunnah of Allah with humanity? It is that Allah gives us a chance, warns us, gives us what we need to know, and if we continue in um, in doing injustice and harm, then we will uh, incur punishment. Mm -hmm. But if we turn to Him. Um, in repentance, he will forgive us. This is the sunnah of Allah with, our, with us. The sunnah of the Quran is that what we see again and again and again is that uh, the Quran was revealed, not always, but in so many cases. So this is one of the one of the aspects of the Quran of the sunnah of the Quran. In so many cases, in response to injustice, a complaint or a difficulty or hardship of the weak. You know, how many occasions, the, the early Muslims who were being persecuted, like Sayyidina Balad, for example, may Allah be pleased with him, the early Muslims who were being persecuted, and even some of them had to verbally reject their faith or belief in Allah. We have, we have, we have the Quran being revealed in response to that, to give them comfort. And to so they know very clearly that this is not this is not a sin. This is not that Allah understands their heart. So when I when I read the Quran and I see in the different places where the Quran addresses women, it's it's astonishing to see in in the vast majority of cases, it's in response to a woman's complaint, to her hardship, to a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So you could say the Sunnah of the Quran with respect to women is responsiveness to try to, to assure them that, that Allah loves them, that Allah hears them, mm -hmm. that their sense of injustice is valid. Um, and if this is the sunnah of the Qur'an, this should be our sunnah as well mm -hmm. with people, with those who are crying for help, whether they're women, whether they're refugees, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. So a very clear case um, in, in the case of the sunnah of the Qur'an being being responsiveness to women is the case of Mujadila, right? And Mujadila, who disputed with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam about a particular Islamic practice and made her complaint to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And he, Subhanallah, what was revealed in response to her situation was such an affirmation of her sense of injustice, of her right to complain, of her faith that Allah is just. Mm -hmm. and would change the situation. Mm -hmm. um, we have also Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was accused falsely of an impropriety, mm -hmm. Surah al nur versus being revealed in response to her difficult situation. Um, so again and again, we have many examples of this. And if we ignore this, mm -hmm. if we ignore this very strong message of the Qur'an, the Sunnah of the, of the Quran, then we're not we're missing a, a major part of of what Allah's guidance, last revelation to humanity tells us, which is that this has to be our position. Mm -hmm. If we want, if we need to have the same kind of presence and responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we have res responsiveness, mm -hmm. on the and on the other hand, you talked about active faith. So this is perhaps the counterpart, so because those women or those people mm -hmm. are active. Right. You mentioned Haja alayhi salam mm -hmm. as an ex mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. or role model for active faith, um, which is until today embodied in the ritual practices of Hajj. So um, what would a tradition of active faith mean for us today? Yes, precisely. It, it means that, that we don't just sit and complain and do nothing about mm -hmm. it. Each, in each one of these examples, these women did something. Mm -hmm. They went to the religious authority, who of course was the Prophet Muhammad SAW at that time, and mm -hmm. they, they did something. They asked for a change. Mm -hmm. They asked for a response. Mm -hmm. They asked for the situation to be addressed. Um, and this is the, uh, the model for Muslim women. If we want to know what Muslim women should do, it is that is that when something's wrong, mm -hmm. that they should be active in changing it. Not as some people say, well, you'll be rewarded if you're patient. Mm -hmm. 
you're not rewarded if you passively accept injustice mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. If you have no choice, if you have no way forward, if someone has you in chains and you have nothing else, then, then of course your continued faith in Allah is rewarded. But we are never asked, Muslim men or women, to simply um, accept without a struggle uh, being harmed and being hurt. Mm -hmm. Or being in a situation that is that is uh, like this, and this is why uh, I began in my talk a comparison of the biblical passage mm -hmm. describing um, a hajjah situation in the desert uh, with the uh, hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he describes what happened when hajjah was brought to the desert with her son Ismail by the prophet Ibrahim. May Allah be pleased with all of them. In the biblical passage in Genesis, Hajjah is depicted as very passive. Mm -hmm. She never speaks. She is, is sent out by Ibrahim. She sits and cries. Mm -hmm. She sits and cries, right? In the, the beautiful, beautiful hadith that is um, narrated uh, the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad says them, where he tells the story of Hajar, she is active. Mm. She asked Sayyidina Ibrahim, uh, is this from you or is this from Allah? Mm. And when he says this is from Allah, then she says Allah will not neglect us. When she runs out of water, she does not sit and cry. She goes and runs looking for a source of water. Mm. She active. runs looking yes. for it. Mm. And when the water comes and some people come and say oh can we can we come and live with you and also benefit from this water she says yes but i will control the water mm -hmm. right she has confidence in her her right to have that authority and she also has confidence in her ability to be a person of justice mm -hmm. and fairness who will make sure that no one takes it over think about today how often how often commercial companies are coming and taking over water mm -hmm. supplies. They go and they sell it, yes. and people are left, you know, the ordinary people are, are left struggling because there's not enough water or there aren't any fish left because mm -hmm. of that situation. So here she is saying, I'm going to control it mm -hmm. because she is someone, a person of righteousness, a person who Allah sent an angel to, mm -hmm. who Allah sent a miracle to, a, a person who Allah chose to establish one of the most important uh, rituals in Islam, an aspect of the, one of the most important rituals in Islam, chose her, selected her to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, she's a person who should have also worldly authority mm -hmm. and who can do it with justice and righteousness. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, that this is a role model to be uh, or to have an active faith. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought about the question because this is, when we talk to Muslim women and men, they are always talking about one type of womanhood and one type of manhood so we were thinking about it, about the question is there an, an ideal model uh, for being a muslim woman and muslim man and for the relationship between man and woman what would you say there is uh, muslim in muslims are individuals like everyone else mm -hmm. allah gave people all different kinds of capacities, gave mm -hmm. men different capacities and women different capacities. And that is necessary. If we all had the same abilities, intellect, capacity, our society would not have all the things that we need. For example, uh, there are some people who are natural risk takers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who, who, who neglect the risks and who are willing to, who are able to endure like physical hardship. Mm -hmm. um, Those are the people who, who are, go out on the frontier, who when something is needed, who go out and, and look for that opportunity. They help move humanity forward. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who don't, who when there's a sound in the night, they don't hide, they get up and they go and they look for it. Mm -hmm. So we, we need those people. There are those who are more introverts, who are more, uh, who are not comfortable taking risks, but they are, have a great ability to, to pay detail to, to a lot of complex information. Mm -hmm. I, I always think of the Hadith scholars as these people. Mm -hmm. The Hadith scholars, they're like the computer programmers and mathematicians. Mm -hmm. They're able to get a lot <laughs> yes. of data and information 
and hours and hours and hours upon it, mm-hmm. focus on it. Mm-hmm. Now, I couldn't do that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I, that's <laughs> totally, not my personality, yeah. <laughs> right? But alhamdulillah, there are people mm-hmm. who are able to do that. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we all, we need each other. Mm. When I was a graduate student mm. and I had two children, mm. um, you know, it, it's very difficult to manage all of those things. I lived with a wonderful woman, Khal Adila, uh, who is a widow mm. from Syria, was living in Chicago. She invited me to live in, in her house Mashallah. while I was a student. And she said to me, she said, look, um, I can't read all those books and study and talk. You know, she'd listen to me on the radio or giving lectures. I can't do all of that. Mm-hmm. You do that. Mm-hmm. But you can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very bad cook. But I'm a great cook. And it's true, mashallah. Her mashallah, food is mashallah. delicious. <laughs> and uh, she said, so we work together. Oh. You yeah. Know? And this is this is the beauty of it. It's not you know every woman's not going to be a good cook, yes. you know every every woman's not going to be interested in in scholarship. Mm. Uh, we all have different things, and men are the same way as well. Mm. Even men are sometimes forced into roles that are not mm. natural yes. to them. It's mm. not their personality. It's not their 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 ability. So the most important thing is that we really um, appreciate the diversity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in us. And we always talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us into, into different shu'ub, yes. yeah. we talk about the different um, linguistic and cultural, the alwan mm. and, and the different languages that Allah, but we also have need to look at the different personalities. And definitely we see that in the Sahaba, that, that there, yes. are, there are women and men of all different personalities. Yes. And it's important that we allow people to develop those so that we have a strong society, so that we have people who can, who can be mirrors to us, who are different than us, who can see within us um, things that are flaws, mm-hmm. um, and also encourage us in, in, in the areas where we can continue to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then because we're diverse, that means our relationships as men and women will also be different. Mm-hmm. We will not all have the same kind of marriages. Mm-hmm. Um, our, there's not an ideal Muslim marriage. Oh. Yes, there are some general parameters mm. for a human being, for family life. We should have muwadda and rahma. We should mm. have love and mercy. We should have respect towards each other. We should make sure that that um, we're willing to step up for mm. our responsibilities. Mm. Um, but that's a very limited framework within which our individual. Mm. Um, human capacities mm. can develop and grow and interact, and we, and we then we learn from each other mm. and complete each other's. Uh, uh, as a family, we can have, inshallah, even within the family, mm. you know, the different things covered. Yes. So, actually, we ra- we ran out of time, I think, but mm. but <laughs> still. <laughs> Uh, so just the short uh, question and the short answer, inshallah, yes, yes. <laughs> if it's possible, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's important. It's very difficult for me. Yeah, yes. uh, <laughs> but let's try it, inshallah. So in Surah 9, Ayah 71, you see a theological imperative for men and women to be allies for the sake of the community. So w- for what reason you see an imperative here and what does it mean to be an ally? Mm. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says المؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء وبعض So wilaya, wilaya is a is a very serious relationship mm-hmm. It is alliance It means that when someone is in a relationship of wilaya it means that we are absolutely loyal mm-hmm. to each other we protect each other we are are there for each other as we say in english i've got your back mm. you know you need me and i'm there for you mm. um it's amazing that uh that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes our relationship as one of allies of mm. of wilaya this relationship mm. in the context of the community formation mm. of establishing prayer yuqimun al-salah Right, establishing prayer, which and we know that iqam al means to establish the mosques and the uh, sermons, the khutbah, all of these different things, that we establish the cat, which means that we establish that whole structure and system of 
collecting charity and also dispensing charity, mm. that we enjoin the good, we forbid the evil. Um, and that means that our collective obligations, our furud kafayat, are the obligations that we have together, furud uh, kafaya, that these obligations that we have together must be done together between men and women. Um, when we do that together, this is where Allah's mercy will be upon us. Because the ayat ends with uh, Allah saying that, Ula'ika mm-hmm. These are the ones upon whom Allah's mercy will be. We are desperately in need of Allah's mercy. Yes. We are de- if, I don't think anyone can deny that we are desperately in need of Allah's mercy. Mm-hmm. Do we want that mercy? If we do, we really need to be serious about working together for our collective obligations. Because, as I mentioned in my talk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala earlier in the same surah mm-hmm. talks about the munafiqun wa munafiqat being together. Mm-hmm. And ba'd, but they aren't awliya, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. Which shows that which shows that their ranks are that their alliance with each other is one of common interests, but not based on sincere values. Mm-hmm. Which means that they can be, you know, that we should have confidence that even with all of their sophistication and money and funding and access to media and everything, that if we are together, Mm -hmm. our partnership will be stronger, more lasting, and um, really more, uh, because it's based on integrity Mm -hmm. rather than simply based on a... uh, alliance of uh, cynical interests. Yes. Thank you very much. It was a great answer and it was a great interview. Thank you very much. I You're hope welcome. we see you soon. My pleasure. Inshallah. Inshallah. Again Inshallah. here Zakallah in Osnurik. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Ya Rahmanu Ya Rahim Ya Rahmanu Ya Rahim